Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 95, recorded March 20th, 2013. Jerry Ornell. Triangulation is brought to you by Pond5.com, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects, templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media files, all yours, go to Pond5.com slash Triangulation. Welcome to Triangulation, the show where we get to talk to the most interesting, most exciting, most... Uh, stimulating, for want of a better word, people on the internet. And uh, we're doing part two of an interview with a guy who has been my idol, really a guy who got me started in this business, because I read his columns in Chaos, uh, the Chaos Manor columns in Byte Magazine and said, you know, that's how technology should be covered from the point of view of a user trying to figure out how to use this stuff. Just love those Chaos Manor columns. Jerry Pornell, still writing, still on the internet, uh, of course, a great science fiction writer, too. I later discovered uh, books like Lucifer's uh, Hammer and uh, just flipped my lid. We did a wonderful show, which I recommend. Before you watch this episode, you go back and watch the uh, part one. Before we get into uh, our interview, let me tell you about our advertiser for today, the company that makes this possible. So you want to support them, Pond5.com. Uh, Pond5 is a site for uh, media creators, people who make media you can uh, go there and get an amazing variety of stock photos of course o over eight million to choose from but one and a half million stock videos most of them high def 753 illustrations they've got music and sound effects too uh, uh, 383,000 cuts third 3d models after effects there's just a huge variety there now every week They've got a, a free stock clip. In fact, this week it's the Portraits of Male Construction, 1920 by 1080. I love this. Now, that, you know, of course, when you download it, you won't have the Pond 5 uh, watermark in there. And just imagine using this in your PowerPoint or your keynote presentation. Or maybe you're a podcaster and, uh, and you want some music for your podcast. The great thing about Pond 5 is what a great browser, a great way. Let, little, how about a little French uh, accordion music from a cafe? I feel like I'm on the Champs Elysees, uh, drinking a cafe with my beret. Oh, thank heaven. Isn't that, doesn't that make you feel uh, $20? Now, all of this is royalty free, which means when you buy it, it's yours forever. Use it any way uh, you would like. Um, but I've got a really an even better deal for you if you go to Pond5 slash triangulation, Pond5.com slash triangulation. A variety of stock media files, 50 different free media files for you to use in your presentations, your movies, your podcasts. Uh, mm, winning. Mm, 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 mm. Now, you notice the prices vary on this, and that's because of a very interesting thing that makes Pond5 unique. Pond5 is the place to go if you are a creator of content as well. If you've got videos that you've made, and uh, or or sound effects or illustrations or photos what a great place to sell because not only do they give you 50 percent royalties that's the best in the business but you set the price so you can determine how much you make pond5.com slash triangulation sign up for an account it's free you'll get 50 free stock media files and i know their ideas once once you're used to pond5 you'll visit it and anytime you need an image or a, uh, an illustration, Those, uh, the After Effects uh, projects are fantastic. All done and totally customizable. Pond5.com slash triangulation. We thank them for their support, and don't forget to get your 50 free files. That offer is going to run out soon. Pond5.com slash triangulation. Now, let's welcome our guest. Hey, Jerry, welcome to Triangulation. Hi. It's good to Thank see you. you again. Now, you, I asked you, because I, I, and I should, people are looking at me going, what, did you just roll out of bed? Too lazy to shave? I'm trying to grow a beard, 
And I and I know you had a as long as I've known you, you've had a mustache. Is that your whole life? Uh, most of it. I thought I had grown it later than I did because I just found this picture. I don't know if you can let's, see it. Let's see. There's a there's well that's you got a mustache and you're and who is that with and you? And that's with Mr. Heinlein. Oh, that's, that's Robert, Robert Heinlein. Heinlein. Wow. And two people in space suits. This is at the first space development conference that I chaired back in about 1980 or 82 somewhere wow. in there. Wow. Wow. And uh, we. Um, you're a fan I, of. I, had uh, it then. I thought I, I must have grown it right about in those days. Though. Yeah. In the 80s, a lot of people had mustaches in the early 80s. You... Actually, I probably grew mine because of Mr. Heinlein. He had a mustache, too. Yeah, he had, had this this small mustache, and I kind of liked the way he looked. <laughs> so I... yeah. I'm getting to be the last of his friends that are still left alive, I think. You represent that, uh, that classic generation of science fiction writers. Uh, I think who influenced so many of them of today's scientists, space scientists particularly, but scientists in general. Yeah, and we kind of intended to. A lot of my stories, and they're still they're just coming out again now on on um, Kindle, which that's awesome. I sell a lot of them through that. Oh, that's um, great. They took place in about the year 2010. To 2020 in that time period, and of course we had asteroid colonies and. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what went wrong? I can't. Moon, a moon base. We had ha we were supposed to have HAL 9000 by 2001. What went wrong? Well, we almost could make HAL 9000 now. We could I do guess, them now, but, yeah. Um, but yeah, most of the 2000. What went wrong was uh, NASA. Yeah. And I, don't, I wouldn't. Would you blame NASA or would you blame government funding for space exploration? Um, look, uh, I was there. The way we we were determined to beat the Russians to the moon. Right. And for a while, it looked like we weren't doing it. And everybody got scared. So basically, NASA turned. The moon project, at, at the, on the orders of the president, it got turned over essentially to General Phillips and the Air Force. Now, it was still a NASA project, but it was being managed by General Phillips, the guy who had put Minuteman together. Well, the military has a way of doing things. It's basically you call in a bunch of competent people, and you go, you take the job you've got to do and you break it down into as many smaller jobs as you can. And you put somebody in charge of each one of those projects that you think can do it. So you call in this guy, you, you've just become the laundry officer. Sir, I'm a master tech. I don't care what you are. I know you can do this job. Go do it. Next case. So you get a lot of misassignments, but you end up with essentially somebody covering everything that ever has to happen. Right. And I don't think most people realize that the second most complicated operation in the history of humanity was uh, the Apollo moonshot. Oh, I think that's not surprising. It was the second most. What do you think the most complicated was? The most complicated project... Mm -hmm. In the history of the world. The history of the world. Well, that's a good question. The Boulder Dam? No, June the 6th. D-Day, of course. D-Day, of course. Of course. It involved more people yeah. and more machines and more... Op well, Le a From a logistical clock. point of view, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. so we did it. We put man on the moon. Now, the Russians had given up trying before we did it. But we were desperate We didn't know enough that. We didn't know no, that. We, well, we didn't know it until late in the yeah. race. Yeah. We were desperate enough that we had a project I took part in called uh, Pilgrim. We had a couple of Air Force Johnnies who were willing to volunteer for a one-way soft Ooh. land on the moon, build yourself a big hutch, and hope to God that we can come get you. <laughs> and that's probably, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what happens with Mars. Well, we, we had guys that were willing to do it, and more than that, uh, we have we had plans. I worked on some of the No habitat. kidding. Um, now, it, by the time 
by, by as as it got later in the program, it became obvious we didn't need that. That we were going to be first, and that was that. Right. But that's how desperate we were. I remember hearing oh. uh, recordings released only recently of JFK just f f furious about how this was going, and 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 really emphasizing how important it was. Well, yep. Kennedy emphasized how important it was and the rest of it, but Kennedy was dead before we got really going. You right, know? right. Uh, but Johnson, having we having committed ourselves, essentially we had committed the prestige of the United States of doing before it. Before this decade and, is out, we will put a man on the moon. And Johnson, more than that, was desperate to be to be seen as fulfilling Kennedy's heritage, right. that he was the right man for Kennedy to have chosen as vice president. Right, and and maybe it would help him uh, overcome the legacy of Vietnam a little bit as well. Well, a lot of things. Again, most of the decisions on Apollo were made before Vietnam ever became all that big in people's uh, Interesting. lives. Interesting. You, we, you, you don't see that, but it, but that's. But Apollo was was the big ace in the Cold War. That was the one that was going to demonstrate to the world that we, and not communism, were the people who knew how to get things done. Right. Can do, American know-how. Any of those phrases mean anything anymore? They they used to. Be <laughs> they big, used to. They used to. Anymore. Yeah. So we did it. We did it the military way, and the military way builds a huge standing army, and then you go and do it. Now, having done it, the military way is then to disband the army. Right. But we had built ourselves a, a, essentially a system of 25,000 development scientists, and the standing army had to be paid. You couldn't disband them. They were all civil servants. Right. So we came up with a shuttle whose job in life was to see to it that it employed 25,000 development scientists. It was a full empro employment program, not a scientific program. Yeah, well, it was both, but yes. Think about it. What do you think the, the marginal cost of a shuttle mission was how much? Well, wasn't the whole point that because it was a reusable uh, booster? The, uh, re yeah, but, but think about what the, what's the cost per mission of a shuttle. I don't know, a few hundred million? You need any number you want because the budget stayed the same whether there were zero or a hundred launches every year. Really? And go back and look at it. The budget didn't change. When we weren't launching shuttles at all, the budget was exactly <laughs> so the, the cost was shuttle. the cost was the employees, the staff, because not the gas, not you know the liquid oxygen. NASA development scientist. Wow. Phil Chapman used to say that and this was back in the eighties that we had spent enough money that we ought to be halfway to Alpha Centauri by yeah. now and we couldn't even get back to the moon. So what should we have done instead? Disband the standing army at the end of the Apollo program and, and, and do it the way we built the Air Force. Put out a bunch of development contracts to a bunch of contractors and let them compete for each other for it. You've always been an advocate for private space exploration. No, I've been an advocate for competition. I wouldn't have minded if you had made the Navy and the Air Force compete for it. Ah. But you, to have a program that builds a big standing army, you're going to get paid whether they're successful or not, just almost never works. Yeah, a bunch of bureaucrats. So, but yet, well, they yet... weren't just a bunch of bureaucrats. These were, understand... Oh, they were scientists, they were of course. People. Yeah. But they were also people who couldn't do anything else. Right. What so, jobs were there available for an expert rocket engineer except <laughs> with the approval of NASA? Right. Now, if we'd had space programs and right. ex my solution to the problem would have been X projects, Which, by the way. And right, I had so right. Newt Gingrich and, um, and, and Bob Walker, and they were set to do it, but it didn't work out that way. The Republicans weren't in office for long enough after. They weren't in office at all during the 80s, and nobody cared what Newt Gingrich and Bob Walker thought in the 80s. Um, X projects are this. You go out to some place like Edwards or China Lake or some awful place where nobody wants to be because nobody ever built no empire's know-how out in China Lake. <laughs> Nobody wants to be there. <laughs> so you go out there and you tell them, I want you to build the best whatever it is you can build with technology as of this afternoon. Fastest ship we ever, the fastest airplane, the highest flying airplane, whatever. 
I want you to build one of those. You build three copies of it. We test one to the edge of it, and we're probably praying it. With the second one, we learn, we, we fly because we learned from the first until we get all the information out of it. And the third one ends up in the Smithsonian. <laughs> and you do that until you build. And, and I'll give you an example. The, the stiletto, the X3 or 4, forget which one it was. It was the first airplane that took off from a runway, went supersonic, came back, and landed again. Okay, like an airplane. Well, it leaked. It was, it it wasn't slow. It was supersonic. But by the time it got turned around, it wasn't very maneuverable. But they took off from Edward, and by the time it got turned around, it was damn near to St. Louis, and it came back and landed. But the the stiletto was the developed the technology for the. 104 Starfighter, the F-104, and the F-104 Starfighter dominated military aerospace for about 20 years. It also proved to be a wonderful instrument for the Air Force to use to keep uh, small countries from bothering us. You take, you, <laughs> we had better technology by that time, but everybody wanted 104s, right? Well, if you wanted to keep them from bothering us, you gave them some. It would take their entire national budget to keep damn things running. So that, that, that didn't give them anything else to play. Don't, to here's some toys. You yeah. Play with these. It, Don't bother go, go me. Go have these. You've got the best airplanes in the world. Have fun at it. It'll now, cost you I, most of your budget. i got a lot of different places on this tree that we can branch off into. Um, <laughs> do you not agree that Curiosity uh, was, a, was a great success, that we've done some interesting things, especially on Mars? Yes, can do wonders if given a specific task and people get out of the way. Yeah. What it can't do is support this big standing army. Well, let me give you an example. I used to be good friends with Dan Golden, who was the administrator of NASA. In fact, I think the biggest moment of terror in the history of NASA was when there was a short rumor that, he, that, that, that they were going to appoint me to be administrator. <laughs> but anyway, I went up there one time to the eighth floor, and it, the place was buzzing. There were people standing in lines for the copy machines and so forth. I went back to California and fooled around for a while. About a month later, I went back there, and I go up to see Dan, in his office, up there, and, and and the place is quiet as a grave. Hmm. And I said, D I read you got rid of some people. And he said, I fired a thousand people from NASA headquarters wow. here. Wow! And I said, Wow! So I went around and started talking to people, and everybody, nobody quite knew who I was, but they knew I was a friend of the administrator and a friend of Mr. Gingrich's, and so everybody talked to me. And I said, How are you doing? And he said wonderful. We're getting more work done than we ever got in our lives. And I said, why? And he said, well, there's nobody in the way. And I said, well, what did all those people do? And he said, you know, we can't figure it out. Nothing we know worse they than must have management. been doing something, <laughs> but, they're not in, but we're getting the work done That's now awesome. and they're not here. What do you now think that, of what do you think of the drone uh, programs that we're doing these days? This is a completely different topic now. What do you want me to think about it? As a concept, you know, I used to teach constitutional law. Yeah. And and history. And as an historian, I worry a little bit about executive power to put people on prescription lists. There is a lot of executive power with that, uh, including, and it, as far as I can tell, there's no... Uh, no limit on whether you even could kill American citizens on U.S. soil that, with these things. Well, that was what Mr. Paul got was a declaration from the attorney general that you can't. Yeah. And that, for that, I admire. I mean, it was a little silly to stand there for 24 hours and it talk worked. all the time in the Senate. But his point was that he wanted a formal statement from the executive denying itself that power. Right. And that, I think, is important. You know how Cicero died? I do not. Cicero is, is, in some respects, the, the embodiment of what most people think was good in the Roman Republic. He said, we must destroy Carthage. That's all I well, remember. No, no, that was Cato. The oh, Cato, other, that's right. Other, that's <laughs> but Cicero was a... Was a he was a rhetorician. 
a middle a middle class yes a rhetorician and he was a new man he was not from one of the old ruling families of rome he was consul in the time of the catalinian rebellion that's right and he was just considered a great statesman and if you like me i had to take latin in in high school we read cicero in the second year along with caesar but after julius caesar was assassinated Mark Antony and Octavius, Caesar's nephew, were taking over. And they made a list of people who would be killed on sight, called a prescription list. These are enemies of the people near to be killed. Uh, Antony's wife insisted that Antony be put on it, uh, that, that, um, that, that Cicero be put on it because he'd insulted her once. Oh. So... Now, imagine the 20th century and the same thing, and you get what I'm afraid of. Yeah. You get to the point where an emperor who has the power to just say, that guy annoys me. Right. And, and a Roman soldier, the, uh, Cicero's last words were to the soldier who had found him, and he, was, he said, young man, there is nothing proper about what you are about to do, but I hope you will do a proper job of it. That's pretty um, brave in the face of uh, but, certain but, death. But more than that, it's a it's a significant thing to think about because the military will do a proper job of what they're told to do. Oh yeah, which is why you want a constitution. What well, that was what Ron Paul was after. He wanted a formal declaration, general, that the president of the United States does not have the power to order the killing of an American citizen on American soil without some kind of due process. It seems so little to ask. Well, you, you will understand that when it comes to the opposite case of it, uh, and we went through all this in the Civil War, you know. There were, Amer there were American advocates of the South in the North, and the military tried to arrest them and take them out and hang them, and the Supreme Court basically said, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. You have to at least, you, you have to, essentially hold them to the end of the war. Well, that's fine on American soil. Uh, I have no objection to blowing some American who's decided he's an enemy of the United States and who's off in Yemen. I don't have any cops in Yemen who can go out and arrest him, if you see what I'm getting at. Yep, yep. Uh, I, I just want there to be some process. If you're going to have Americans put on a on a list of people who can be killed on site, I think there ought to be a decision by more than just the president one afternoon because his wife nagged him. So we got into this because we were talking about uh, what NASA uh, should have done. Where would we be today if NASA had approached it this way, project after project after project, well, goal after goal after goal? What should the goals have been? Thank you for... Um, for giving me that opportunity. If you go on to um, um, Kindle, you will find a whole bunch of my books, one of them called Exile and Glory, and there are some others about what I thought w the, the world would look like in 2020. Mm. Uh, asteroid mines, we're plowing out there at the edges of the reach of the galaxy. I mean, of the solar system. We're not nowhere near going in. And we're staying away from planets because it's too hard to get off of them once you get back on them. But uh, we are building a, a, a space-faring civilization. And I think that could have been done. And uh, It's not it too late, like, is it, Jerry? I mean, I hope it's not too oh, late. Oh, it looks like Elon Musk is trying to make it yeah, happen. Yeah, It's It just took a lot longer than I thought. And there's less money for it on the other hand. Our technology is better. We can make stronger and lighter materials. Yeah, I mean, the last big Space X project we ever had was the little DCX that was designed in my living room in which we <laughs> we sold to the vice president, General Graham and Max Hunter, and I We've got a picture of us in the vice president's office when Quayle was 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 vice president and chairman of the National Space Council. We built it, the little thing flew up and hovered around and came down and landed on its own tail, you know, and reusable. You fill it up with fuel and you fly it again. 
we had intended a big 600,000 pound version of it that might or might not have made orbit, but would have been a real X project, would have let you know what it took to make orbit with one. Yeah. But they didn't have the money, so they built a scale model of it, 60,000 pounds. It was never going anywhere. But it did demonstrate that you can do it. You can mail the ship, fly it, bring it back, pump it full of fuel, and do it again. We did 11 times. Same ship. I, how many missions? What's the most missions that any shuttle ever flew? Not I forget 11, how many. I'm sure, but, but yeah. But the shuttle was not a reusable craft. It was rebuildable. Yeah, right. And it took so dang long to rebuild it that it might as well not have been. Well, you see what I'm getting at. Do you, you think that the future of humankind is is uh, in space? Well, I'll give you Arthur Clarke's observation. He says if humanity is going to survive, then for all but a very brief period of its history, the world ship is going to have meant spaceship. Yeah. Because what, how long is the Earth good for? Well, I think another, we have a few billion left, isn't it? No, yeah. few, maybe, maybe, 100, few hundred maybe, million. Enough, maybe another couple of hundred million, but yeah. how long before uh, a dinosaur killer hits us if we well, don't have anything that, to yeah. do about it? Right. Um, we know that maybe every million years something with... Catastrophic, yeah. Multi-megaton, and every 10 million years, something with many multi-megatons of power. Right. And every 100 million years, something as big as uh, the thing that wiped out all the dinosaurs' heads. That, that's a pretty big event. Maybe I don't we know should how... plan for that, Jerry. Well, yeah, I think so, obviously. <laughs> hey, Jerry, move, next... your, move your microphone up a little bit. It's hitting your shirt uh, right now. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. That, so, that's, my next, that's my next novel is, uh, is, is doing something about it. You got Lucifer's Hammer was about a, a asteroid. About hitting, a comet we couldn't comet. do anything about and how to, how to survive it. Right. And um, pretty dang good book. Uh, I agree. It holds up very well. I agree. Even though it's 30 years old. Next one's going to be about not letting it happen. And you're doing this with uh, Jerry Niven? You're with still Larry. Oh, Larry, Jerry. Jerry. Larry. You're Jerry. He's Larry. You're, yeah. you're still working with Larry, huh? Yeah. That's awesome. How does that, how does that partnership work? Superbly. <laughs> I think anybody who's read any of the books would agree. Well, certainly financially it has been. We've made more money with our collaborations than Nordoff and Hall did with Mutiny on the Bounty. So when when was the last Niven Pornell uh, book? Oh, probably 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, it's been a while. Old, yeah. yeah. And we, 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 uh, we did couple with Barnes on uh, the first interstellar colony. It was we, we put it 10 light years away in a slower than light universe travel situation and tried to show some of the problems you might have if you have a couple of hundred people and that's it. They're never going to get any help. They're never going to get anything else. What they brought is what they've got. And maybe the planet has some surprises for you. That's called Legacy of Herot. And uh, the next book in that series was called Beowulf's Children. The Gripping Hand was 94. That might be the last one. Huh? Uh, Gripping Hand was a sequel to Moten God's Eye. We right. have since that time written... I know we've written two heroic fantasies. Um, um, so the has, Burning City. You don't. You're not in the same room when you're writing together. Not much now. We were at first. We we start. We wrote Molten God's Eye and Lucifer's Hammer basically on typewriters, electric typewriters. <laughs> banging. On, I just imagine in the same room banging away. Sometimes I'd write something and he'd write something, and sometimes <laughs> not. And merging the two. Manuscript was not easy. Once we <laughs> got an old, once we got electric, we got Z80s with electric pencil. Ezekiel. Ezekiel. He was on display in the Smithsonian until recently. He's not there anymore? Uh, they closed that history of computers and communications wing, and they 
claim they're going to reopen it. I, I have so. no idea when or whether Zeke will be in it, but he was certainly on display for 20 or 30 years, yeah. and that's doing pretty good. That's all right. I mean, yeah. How many people do you know whose personal <laughs> computer has been on display in the Smithsonian? You're the only one I know of. Yeah, probably all of them. Yeah. <laughs> I know all of them. <laughs> That was an S100 computer, and I remember you wrote a lot about Ezekiel in those days. At, yeah, uh, he was Ezekiel, my friend who happened to be an S100. Yeah. <laughs> Do you you have the same? Now, in those days, you really did have to spend a lot of time massaging, tweaking, and getting these things working. And you, you and your son, I know, spent a lot of time banging on them. It's a little different now. They're really commoditized, aren't they? And they and their appliances. Uh they are, and that was one reason why I don't do so much of that writing anymore, because they have become a commodity, and it's not such an adventure. No. But on the other hand, Eric and I have recently built some new machines, and I've okay. got a... I've got a, a Windows 8 machine, which I must say I am working very hard at trying to like. And um, I know what you mean, Jerry. I really want to like it. There are features about Windows 8 that I want to like, but my heavens, when I spend half my time trying to figure out how to open the control panel. I know. <laughs> you got to, oh, you swipe in from the left. Oh, but wait a minute. You're in Metro, so you're going to get the Metro <laughs> control panel. You got to go to desktop, swipe in from yep. the left. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, but yet, as Eric points out, with the the new Microsoft um, Xboxes, they've got this kinetic, this gesture control yeah, business. Yeah, yeah, And that will come along shortly, and Windows 8 may be perfect for that. You don't even have to touch the keyboard. You just wave your hands around like, uh, like, a crazy like they person. did in, in Minority Report, if you remember foo, the... Foo. Yeah. What technology so, that we, do we not have that you would like to see that you were, you were really hoping they would have by now? Uh... Actually, it's got about where I thought it would be. You don't want to uh, see uh, uh, a computer you could talk to that would talk back to you, or? I, you know, oddly enough, I, I, I don't. And the reason is that um, I, I find that that I don't dictate well. Yeah. And that's just because I gotten I can type fast. Right. And it's so easy to edit. I mean, Microsoft Word is a little big and cumbersome, but it works, and it works fine, and it works fast. Right. And um, I can type faster, at, at least as fast as I think. And so talking doesn't do me any good. I think that's always true. Even if you only had to fix one word in 100, that's going to slow you down to the point yeah. where typing's faster. Yeah, and, and, and when I was younger, um, do you remember, you ever read, uh, stories by a guy named Miller about a uh, post-atomic war world called uh, Canical for Leibowitz. Oh, I loved Canical for Leibowitz. That was in a well, wonderful book. And in and, and the third volume of that series, he had Lo the Lighter. He had a, he had a, um, he had the abbot of the St. Leibowitz's abbey, um, was talking to the abominable auto scribe <laughs> and he would dictate something in English and it would give him a Latin <laughs> version of what he had said. And I always thought that would be an interesting thing to have. Yeah. Well, I, don't, I think Google's working on that actually. I'm pretty sure they are. Translation works pretty good now. Yeah. When yeah. I was, um, that's when kind I of amazing, isn't it? I mean, one of the things that's so interesting is this stuff moves slowly enough that you don't really notice it, and all of a sudden you're dictating in a foreign language. Yes, and, well, let me give you an example. Um, early days, John McCarthy, he, he died last year. He was head of artificial intelligence yeah. at Stanford for essentially all his life. Uh, old friend of mine, good friend. Um, John had two ambitions. One of them was he, he worked on automatic language translation. And in those days, one of the tests was you would feed the translator a phrase. It would translate it into Russian or Chinese. Those were the ones that were being fun, funded, oddly enough, in, those, in the Cold mm -hmm. War days. 
<laughs> and then you take the translation that came out and feed it back into the system and see what it gave you. And the classic one was if you start with the phrase, uh, the spirit is willing, but at the flesh is weak, you fed it in in Russian and it came back with the meat is good, but the vodka is awful. <laughs> Which may be not a bad translation. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's got a lot better than that. <laughs> but I One bet you if you said, I'll take 400 uh, truck mufflers, uh, can you deliver them on Thursday? It'd be a ter perfect round trip. <laughs> Just don't do yeah. poetry. Um, they, one of the... Oh, one, one of John's ambitions was to build robots that could really do complicated things. And do you remember Heath Kits? Oh, yeah, of course. It, in those days, you could buy from Heath Kits, you could, you could buy actually a computer kit, but mostly they were radio transmitters and, right. you know, ham stuff. And um, they, they had, in the, in the early days, Heath Kit actually would sell you a uh, kit to make your own television set, <laughs> which was, if you built it, would have been a little better than what you could get down it there wasn't any best buys in those days but to make company or a department store you could go down there and buy a television set well the Heath Kit one was a little better and um john wanted to have a robot make it so he ordered one so the kit came and the graduate students were looking in the boy that's wonderful. Let's open this up and see what we have to do. And John said, no, 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 no. We want the robot to open the case and take it out and inspect the parts and then start building it. Well, 10 years later, he hadn't got a robot that could open the case. Yeah. Uh, everything yeah. goes slow, and then suddenly it goes fast. Right. Then suddenly there are automated uh, assembly lines. Right. And, um, I mean, America manufactures more stuff now than it did 10 years ago, but there are far fewer manufacturing jobs than there used to be. It's all made by machines. It's If you can do a repetitive task, on the other hand, there was a, I suppose it's considered uh, politically incorrect now, but there was a common phrase in the robot industry that... Um, you never understand how smart a moron is until you try to program a robot. <laughs> it's true. A moron can walk, can recognize and, faces. And can follow a great number of instructions yeah. without having you translate them into little movement at a right. time. Move this hand, this 221 centimeters and no further, and... That's so true. You don't have to do that. You can tell the guy to pick it up. You can update it, Jerry. Say a four-year-old. Now, that would be politically correct. Uh, actually, no. A four-year-old would be an idiot, I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> I mean, th you understand. These pick were the, the age you want. <laughs> these were definitions that were taught us in graduate I school. I remember, yeah. In normal psychology. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, an idiot has a mental age of under four. Yeah. Four or under, and an, an adult or a person of near adult years. So an, uh, an imbecile is one of an adult age between five and, um, I think, ten. And a, um, a moron is one ten to twelve. I think they've taken those definitions out of the DSM. Oh, they've taken them out because they consider them <laughs> insulting now. But uh, they were perfectly reasonable definitions. It was just a time. word? Yeah. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, now they talk about dull, normal, right. and mentally challenged. And right. the, the thing is that when you're talking about an imbecile, he ain't going to understand what word you're using to begin <laughs> with. So it, you're not insulting him, if you see what I mean. You're insulting somebody who thinks he ought to be insulted. But then that's there are a lot of people in this world who spend their lives getting unhappy on the part of other people, even though what you do doesn't make them unhappy, they think it makes somebody else unhappy. And I suppose we need people like that. I'm just not one of them. Somebody in our chat room said uh, he's working now at an incubator where they've created a machine that makes a perfect hamburger. You put the ingredients in one end and you get burgers and bags cooked perfectly at the other end. There Good. goes a bunch of Great. jobs. Well, they're going an awful lot of jobs if they can do that. Yeah. Uh, the problem is, of course, uh, 
some terrorist puts a rat in one end. <laughs> what do you think of Google I, I wish Glass? I were joking, by the way. Pardon me? I, I wish I were joking, by the uh, way. What do you think of Google Glass? You want uh, these glasses now? Did, uh... No. No, I not don't. for you. Maybe somebody would want them, but I don't. No. How about um, just uh, thinking of some of the genomics? I mean, we're seeing some amazing uh, uh, steps forward in genomics. I think some have said, I know Bill Gates believed this, that the next revolution, you know, post-information revolution is going to be a genomics revolution. Um, yeah. I. Bill's... Bill is an amazing man. He thinks of a lot of things, and he thinks pretty deeply about them. Sometimes he gets way off base, and he gets stuck off base for a while, and he did as much harm to education as he did good for a while, but that's... Uh, he, he, he came up with the notion a few years ago that every American child deserves a world-class... We talked uh, about this last time. Yeah. Education. Yeah. And that probably did more damage to American schools than any other single notion in the last 20 years or 30 years. Uh, but he comes up with some awfully good stuff, too. And my heaven, he spent the last years of his life giving his money away. Isn't that nice? You have to admire him. Yeah, yeah you got to admire that. He's keeping a billion or so just for... Uh... Uh, he'll, he'll keep enough to be happy, but he's already publicly said he's not going to leave his kids more than about five million bucks each. That if they can't live on that, they they that's too bad. That's actually smart. That's there's nothing that debilitates somebody more than the knowledge that you don't ever have to make well, your way in the world. In my generation, the the, the example was Barbara Hutton, she the was, Woolworths millionaire. She was uh, she was. Let us say she had an interesting career. The Paris Hilton of her time. Uh, yes, and, and then some. Yes, <laughs> yeah. There's always been one. What about, so the chat room's asking me uh, to ask you about various technologies. Autonomous vehicles. You want a car that drives itself? At my age, yes. <laughs> Wouldn't that be if nice? Say, you get in the car and say, take me to the movies. Or, or take me to Lhasa. I don't go very far in cars, but yes, uh, Larry and I had the problem have a have a seminar at University of California in Irvine in about two weeks, and um, I, he was going to get a cataract operation. In which case, I couldn't. Neither one of us could go because I wouldn't. I wouldn't dare drive him that far on a freeway anymore. But apparently he can stay. He not he he delayed the operation, so he'll he'll drive me, and that'll work. We'll still get there. Hey, is yes, that open I to the public? To can anybody a, can anybody go to see that? Do I have... don't know. It's the university. It's 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 great. Look up Greg Benford and science fiction seminar, and Boy, it'll be some. Because Greg and Larry and I are on a panel to talk about some science fiction stuff at at about noon. And, oh, that'll be something to see. About two, three weeks. You, yeah. You see Irvine. You see Irvine. Yeah. The future is Greg, here. Greg. California in science That's fiction. It. That's uh, it. April fourth. Larry, Jerry, Greg Benford, Sheila Finch, and Stephen Barnes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, along with the boy, it's a it's really a great event. I think Dave Brin's going to be there. Yeah. I love David Brin's stuff. Who do you read these days? Who do you like? Do you read science fiction still? Uh, yeah, I probably read more detective stories than I do science fiction. Well, who now. do you like in detective stories? Grace. Robert Grace. Robert Grace. All right, I have to try. I have not read any the of Monkey's this. Monkey's Raincoat, among other things. He's got some novels about a guy named Joe Pike who's a homicidal maniac, and I get a little... <laughs> <laughs> wary of those because there's not so much story in them as just a lot of self indulgencies about things you'd you'd like to do to bad guys. But every now and then that's kinda of fun. What would you like to do to a bad guy? But uh <laughs> I, I, I can I can take only so many novels of those. Um do you, Kindles do you... are wonderful, you know. You can carry the dang Kindle around, read anywhere. Yeah. You stand, find yourself standing in line at a bank, or the waitress is taking too long for your coffee. Then you can read a few pages. It's uh, it's great. Have they made yeah. movies? I'm trying to think. They've never made movies out of Moton God's Eye, or uh... no. We've been paid a fair amount of money and options for a number of our movies. Because I'm thinking, you mentioned Minority Report. A lot of Philip K. Dick uh, stories became. 
movie yes. roughly Same. related to the story. Um, seems like boy, roughly related to the to the story. Yes, indeed. And roughly. they all came just when poor old Phil died. I mean, it, yeah. it, it's just amazing. The money started flowing in just after he couldn't use it, oh. and boy, did he need it. Oh, that's he, sad. He pretty well died in poverty, you know. He. Did you uh, so did you know did you know uh, Philip K. Dick? Oh, I knew Phil not as well as Tim Powers did. I yeah. mean, nobody knew him as well as Tim Powers did. But yeah, I knew Phil. Uh, there was a big party at a professor's house in Fullerton in the mid '70s, and it happened that Caltech had a big science fiction convention. Uh, sponsored, I think, by, uh, by Richard Feynman, I think, was one of the sponsors. And wow. they brought Sir, wow. Sir Fred Hoyle and oh, Fred Pohl great. and Harry Harrison and me and Larry Niven and a whole bunch wow. of other people came to it. So they had a big party out in Fullerton afterwards. And um, Phil Dick came to that. He, he didn't come to the Caltech conference because he didn't go to things like that much. And... Um, at the time I talked to him, he had he was married to Tessa. The baby was about a year old, and she had brought the baby with her. And I talked to him a while, and I, I give you some notion of how well I didn't know him. Um, I I asked him how things were going. He says fine. I found out later from Tim Powers that Phil was eating dog food at at uh. that exact time. Oh. Uh, they were down to it. They were down to literally down to what Harry Harrison used to call eating money. Um, I didn't know that at the time. He passed away at a uh, young age, 53. Fairly young, and um, he wasn't a very happy man for most of his life. Um, I, I can't say I knew him well. Tim Powers is the one who knew him very well. But if you think of the movies, Total Recall, Blade Runner... Yeah, Minority Report we mentioned, Paycheck, the Adjustment Bureau, just so many. Yeah, he was an idea. He was an idea guy. Yeah, exactly. He wasn't a high technology guy. Not he at all. just assumed the technology he wanted for his stories. Right. He never went into how how it might work or not work. You know. Right. You're the idea guy, aren't you? Isn't that your role, kind of in the Niven Pornell? Oh, actually. It's more complicated than that. I come up with some of the ideas. Larry comes up with some of them. It's my job to make them plausible. You add the science. I add, I add science and logic and self-consistency to these things. Larry, Larry is, is likely to get an idea and just carry it as far as he goes, and that's good for short stories. Right. But it doesn't make a novel. My, my job in these things is to add the continuity so that it, um, it it looks seamless all the way through. Yeah. He writes better than I do. I don't make any claims otherwise. But I, well, when we're in public, we usually say he writes better than I do and I think better than he does. And he, <laughs> tends, he tends to agree with that, but it's not strictly true, you understand. Well, I'm thinking of Ringworld, which is one of my favorite uh, books. But Ringworld wouldn't work, and when he wrote it, it didn't work. And not only that, but in the first edition of it, he had the earth turning in the wrong direction. <laughs> the sun was rising in the uh, west. Well, it wasn't, but a guy was going west to, to gain time, um, I mean, to lose time, so... <laughs> It's little things like that, you know. That, that, that may, it's actually really important that you have a consistent universe. And and that Larry doesn't like to do that kind of stuff much. I mean, if pointed out to him, he'd say, oh, yeah, well, let's fix that. But um, he, he care. gets this vision of what he wants to say, and he's more important, more interested in telling me. He and Benford work well together on, on, on and that, that bowl of heaven of theirs is a really a great concept. Again, it's well, you read it and you'll see the contrast between that and something like Lucifer's Hammer. Right. You'll see the Pornell influence. No, you'll see the lack of it. <laughs> well, yes, that's what I mean. You'll see what uh, Pornell adds, exactly. And, well, you can see that they tell a story somewhat differently from the way mm -hmm. Larry and mm -hmm. I tell a story. That mm -hmm. That's... I'm not saying it's better or worse. It's just that they do it differently from the way we do it. 
I'm glad to see that you are thriving financially. You're not eating dog food, right? I'm not eating dog food, and one reason for that is electronic book rights. And one thing I'll say to anybody who's listening to us now, um, if if you're contemplating being a writer, and an awful lot of the people who like to watch me do interviews are hoping to figure out how in the hell can I get his job. Um, one of the things you understand is, for gun's sakes, don't give a publisher eternal yeah. rights to your electronic book rights. It isn't where it, it would be unless they're offering an enormous advance, you're better off to publish it yourself than to give them eternal life of the contract electronic rights. Now, if you get electronic rights for a term of years and it's a reasonable advance, that's one thing. But I have seen a pocketbooks and Random House and a lot of other places are offering new writers contracts that don't give them much money up front and take the electronic rights forever. Yeah, don't or, do that. I mean, they'll give you some percentage of it, you understand. But they keep they keep the lion's share of the electronic rights forever. And, and as far as I can see, the electronic rights are worth more than the print rights now. If they're not, they will be. Yeah, I agree 100. percent Are all your I mean, books well, on Kindle? I mean, I'm getting, I'm, I'm selling a thousand, more than a thousand copies a month of Lucifer's Hammer That's at awesome. about eight dollars. You multiply those numbers out, and you'll see it's not a bad income. That is awesome, Jerry. It just and that's a 40-year-old book. Yeah. Now, without that, I, I would have a little bit more. Authors don't have much in the way of retirement, and after 2008. Most of them have a lot less yeah. than they, they thought they had. Because yeah. um, we're not very good businessmen. One reason the Berne Convention, the International Copyright Convention, is so simple is that um, uh, Victor Hugo wrote it. <laughs> and he basically said, writers are terrible bookkeepers and forgetful. And so he wanted to keep it simple, no renewals, life plus 50 years. That's term of contract. No, no renewal, no more anything else. Um, and Hugo was enough of a literary giant around when he wrote that, which was around the turn of the night of the 20th century, um, that he was able to get away with. The United States didn't go along with it for 75 years after after the Berne Convention. We weren't part of an international. Eventually. They decided to do that, and having done it, then, of course, they added another 20 years to the 50 years so that Disney wouldn't go out yeah. of <laughs> Mickey Mouse, the old Mickey Mouse copyright. What's yeah. your? Do you have a favorite book of yours? My favorite book? Not sure. I think the most influential book I wrote was probably A Step Farther Out, which is nonfiction. Right. I guess Hammer is one of my favorites. We, Larry and I had a lot of fun writing that. I like Footfall a lot. Footfall was honest to God science fiction about an alien invasion. I mean, you could say Lucifer's Hammer was a disaster story. Oh, yes. Footfall was about two-trunked elephants. <laughs> the intelligent two-trunked elephants. You can't say that's not science fiction. <laughs> what part of uh, writing do you like the best? Having done it. <laughs> now you stole like that. Most from... writers. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I got that from any. I think Mark Twain said that. <laughs> oh, there are hundreds. There are, I, I have known thousands of writers. I've known maybe five who like to write. Yeah. Isn't that Niven interesting? Likes to write. Um, but, but why do you write then if you don't like it? I like to have written. It's <laughs> rewarding. Why do, you, why do you run a mile? Because at the why end, do you, run five you miles? feel better, yeah. All right. Yeah, because you feel, you know, why do you stop hitting yourself in the head with a hammer? <laughs> <laughs> it feels so good when you stop. No. Uh, I, I, I like to have written. I like everything about writing, but the action, and sometimes, sometimes things will just start flowing and you can't write fast enough and everything's wonderful. But if you count on that, don't be a writer. How many because, how many words a day do you write? Now, not so very many. <laughs> uh, at a time, 
I used to do, when I was doing the bite columns, I had to do 10,000 words a month of, uh, of, of nonfiction. Like, you know, uh, I do this stupid stuff so you don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> Looking around with, 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 with technology. Yeah. And then <clears throat> Larry and I were turning out 240,000 not word novels every couple of years Amazing. so you you work it out it's it uh, and and I was often at that time doing the science columns for Galaxy or some other major science fiction magazine so I used to turn out a lot I used to could write a lot and did it just uh, I'm 80 years old now Leo and I don't get those periods when everything just flows very well as often as I used to well, what do you like I, to do I remember these... Isaac, Isaac was having the same problems when he got old. He, Asimov, yeah. I, Isaac was, yeah, Isaac was, was, was the one writer that you could absolutely say liked to write. He was prolific. He was enormously prolific, and he loved to write. And, I mean, it, it, was, it was enough that his wife would have trouble getting him to come out a dinner party that he was guest of honor of because he wanted to write one more page. That type of thing. He just loved it when he was writing. He felt better when he was writing than he did at probably any other time of his life. Are you there? Yeah. No, I'm just thinking about oh. Isaac Asimov and unfortunately yeah. thinking about the fact that our time is oh. coming to an end. All right. <laughs> I just, somebody in the chat room said something really great. One cool old dude, the kind of guy you'd really like to know. Well, good. I'd like to know you, too. <laughs> there, we're just loving it. In fact, as soon as I said it's part two of our interview, everybody went crazy in the chat room. Said, yay, Jerry's back. We love having Jerry Pornell on. We'll have you on Twit soon. And who knows? Maybe we could just make this an ongoing series. Well, we can do this again if you like. I, I like talking to you. You 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 let me talk. <laughs> I, I talk too much. No, you no brought, no you do not. You talk well, I just was right. Brought up in radio, <laughs> That's and right. literally, I mean, my first my my father was the manager of WHBQ in in Memphis, Tennessee. Right, and we lived in the Gayoso Hotel, which is where the the station was that was part of what what we got during the depression as um, as 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 part of his salary and um i was on the air at age four or five and intermittently after that and you sort of learn when you're doing that that there's no dead time well if somebody doesn't leap in see right there yep. see, <laughs> somebody doesn't leap in to say something you do it because do there it. should be no dead air it's really yeah. a, a flaw of mine that I've been trying to overcome because I have had, I've been in radio since 76, and you're exactly right, no dead air. And I have to remember, sometimes it's okay to let it to pause. <laughs> <laughs> but not for long. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Pornell, you're the greatest. JerryPornell.com. He continues to write. He may hate it, but he continues to write. There's lots yeah. of good stuff there. And there's lots of good books in, on Kindle, and in, uh, in, in, uh, you, you can go find them all, and they're cheap. If you haven't read Footfall, Lucifer's Hammer, Moat in God's Eye, The Gripping Hand, there's so many great books. Just search on yeah. Amazon and get well, the get the ebook e version because Jerry likes and, it. And, and if you don't if you don't like modern fantasy, try ours. Nevin and I wrote a different kind of fantasy. It's it's sort of hard fantasy with rivets. Uh, that would be which one? The Burning ones? City Beowulf and Burning Children's? Tower are the major okay, ones. Okay, okay. Good. I like fantasy, actually. And I think there's a whole new market for fantasy because of Game of Thrones and, uh, and it, its popularity. So. Fantasy is bigger than science fiction as far as the market is concerned. We were expecting to do a lot better with... with uh, with Burning City, I'm not. I, I thought I think that in some respects, uh, Burning Tower is one of the best novels we ever did, as as just as an entertaining novel. Well, now I've got to read it. I've never re read it. Well, read Burning City first. Burning it's not City. that you have to, but Burning City, Burning City was Larry, Larry had to write it because he got tired of the riots in Los Angeles and he wanted to write something about it. Burning Tower was just a novel set in the times that we had invented for Burning City. So in some respects, Burning Tower is much more of a novel 
And I think it's a great love story myself. Well, I'm, I'm going to get both of these on my Kindle right now, Burning Tower and Burning City. Good. Thank you, Jerry. Great to talk to you once again. We're going to do a new show. It's going to be called This Week in Pornell. <laughs> <laughs> and you can just talk about anything you want to. Well, I don't mind sitting in on Twitter every now and then. You'll be back soon. Got that? Book him for Twit. Thank you, Jerry Purnell. Thank you. Take care. We do, Bye. We do triangulation every Wednesday afternoon about, uh, about 4 p.m., 3 p.m., sometime in there. Uh, Eastern, Pacific Eastern time, it's uh, 6 p.m., 7 p.m. Uh, and if you're on uh, UTC, well, I guess that'd be about uh, 2200 UTC on twit.tv. Watch live because I totally helps me to hear the questions the chat room wants to know. We Really, you're the third leg of that stool and triangulation. Uh, but if you can't watch live on-demand audio and video of all of our shows, there's 95 now available at twit.tv slash T-R-I. So go download them or subscribe to the show, and that way you'll get every episode when it comes out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Triangulation. Triangulation.